everyone. So my name is uh, Ben Lesky, and thanks for this opportunity um, to uh, share my story with you today. Uh, with, as people living with a brain tumour or with experience caring for people with a brain tumour in the room, I actually feel like I'm among friends today. Um, now, no two people are ever the same, and I realise we're all at different stages of our journeys in this room, but I hope that some of my experiences might um, resonate with you, as you've pro possibly been there too. So today, I'd like to uh, share with you a little bit about my journey uh, with brain cancer, some of the lessons I've learned along the way, five key moments that stand out for me, um, alongside the nuts and bolts, uh, the shit stuff, you can insert your own swear word there, and also the good stuff, where I actually see there's some opportunities that have come from my cancer diagnosis. So there's positive things along with the challenging. But first though, uh, as in the previous presentations, I wanted to acknowledge the, um, our great privilege really to live here in Australia and in Melbourne. Um, growing up here, we had the option of treatments of surgery techniques and tools that um, many people around the world can only dream of, and clinical trials and a universal healthcare system. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So to the story of my diagnosis, um, in 2011, I was busy working at Melbourne Uni. Um, as a manager, I was setting up um, industry partnerships in the Faculty of Arts, and I'd had a background working in international politics and foreign policy in Canberra, and I'd worked at Monash Uni too. And I was scheming a career change to follow my parents' footsteps into secondary school teaching um, and to pursue an obsession, really, with all things German, music and politics. I've been working several years as a freelance choral conductor, which was a hobby at that time, and I wanted to make this a bigger part of my life. I thought, why not share it if you love it? Um, now, toward the end of 2011, I started to notice moments where I felt funny. I wasn't able to speak, even though I could understand what was going on around me. And they started around 30 to 40 seconds and they were getting longer. They started to happen in work meetings, um, once when I was presenting to a group of students and at least once in front of a choir, although I was able to look down at the uh, music stand, pretend I was deep in thought and uh, got away with it that way. Um, but my, my, uh, my boss saw uh, one of these, as I now know them, these seizures occurring and said, you need to go straight to the doctor. And my GP referred me to an MRI, and I love my friend Tali's description of the MRI machine as being like a, a bear hug from a robot. <laughs> um, I remember the night I went in for that first MRI and a look of deep concern in, my, in the radiologist's face. And now I've just had my 24th MRI last week, I realised that that look is not normal. Um, in late January 2012, my neurologist, Chris Plummer, at St Vincent's Hospital, called me in early and gave us the bad news that it was a mass the size of a large chicken's egg up here. Um, now, those moments I talked about were focal, partial focal seizures that were causing speech aphasia, and they've been getting worse. He referred us to a neurosurgeon, uh, a great neurosurgeon, Paul Smith, at St Vincent's Hospital. Now this was a huge moment of upheaval for us in our lives. My partner Kung was with me for the diagnosis. My sister came immediately to the hospital and my parents and my brother came up from Adelaide to Melbourne the next day and they ended up staying for two months. There was a flurry of blood tests and MRI scans before the surgery to work out where the speech, where my speech was located. Um, functional MRIs found it on this side of my brain. I had my first surgery within three weeks and I remember my feet shaking uncontrollably the following morning when I found out that I'd been diagnosed with an astrocytoma. At that point, anaplastic astrocytoma, so grade three. I had a second awake surgery uh, three weeks later because the mass was too large to remove in one operation. I remember moments of this second awake surgery quite vividly. I remember watching my blood pressure going up and down in the monitor as I was able to calm my mind. I remember the constant questions from the anaesthetist as they were kind of checking my left side. Um, and I remember my surgeon's sense of humour, and he's got a great one. Um, and I also remember the moment that the, their coded discussions between the surgeons stopped, and they started talking about their dinner plans and what cases they had on later in the week. <laughs> and I was a little bit disturbed at that point, but then I realised that probably meant that the, uh, the surgery had been a success. So, as I said, I was initially diagnosed with a grade 3 astrocytoma and I was put forward for a clinical trial. And this proved to be a blessing in disguise. 
My tumour sample was sent overseas, but it was rejected. They found that it was, they only found grade two tumour tissue. So to be truthful, I'm actually somewhere in between. My surgeon treats me as a grade three, but I have a grade two, three rating. And so I'm lower grade, but I'm still certainly malignant. Um, my planned trial of radio and chemo was cancelled just a week or so before it was to start. And this was a big shock because I dropped from active treatment to monitoring. The surgeon said, come back in three months for your next MRI. It was kind of like having your bags packed and being ready to board a plane for a long haul flight and it gets cancelled at the last minute. But I recovered gradually and I went back to my familiar university world uh, to start a PhD in politics the following year. And I was thinking that it would free me up to do more choir work at night time. I was so wrong. It was uh, hard work. Six months in and working full time on my PhD and I was taking three choirs at the same time during the week. I had my first post-operative -oper uh, seizure and it was a really scary experience. Um, but it's one we've actually got under control. I took it as a sign for my body to slow down. But it also helped me to sharpen my focus. And I realised that politics wasn't really the right call for me. My time was limited and I needed to focus on what I loved most. And, um, and that was, so it was community choirs and singing. So I was very lucky, I was able to change to a topic in community choral music. And I haven't looked back. Choir actually has been a really big part of my journey. Um, getting back to conducting the youth chorus uh, as soon as I could. Singing with uh, a choir, the practical and emotional support that this choir provided. Um, and the sense of family and familiarity were all really important. Not to mention the well-being benefits that come from choral singing. So I recommend everyone joins a choir. Um, in late 2014, there's some photos up here, I learnt that my, um, my tumour had recurred and I had to go in for a third awake surgery on the 29th of November, followed by some rehabilitation and physiotherapy to improve some deficit on my left hand side. So it shows you it was very close to my uh, neural motor cortex. This was followed by radiotherapy in February and March last year. At the moment it's stable and we're, mon we're monitoring things closely. If it's needed I'm grateful that the option of surgery remains on the table as each time we go in the risks get greater to paralysis basically on my left side. But look these are just the facts and I'd like to move beyond these to talk about key moments of awareness or awakening that have happened for me during my journey. And I call cancer as a journey because it's part of me. It's part of my genetic makeup. And after coming out as a gay man, I'm done fighting with myself. So five key moments. The first was the night before my very first surgery. Kung, my family and I were sitting around the kitchen table. We were planning the next few months. You know, meals and the choir were helping out there appointments and that type of thing. We turned our Michael Lunick age calendar to March 2012 and this image appeared. Now I taught a musical setting of this to choirs in the previous few years um, and I was just stunned to see its connection to the brain. Let it go, let it out, let it all unravel, let it free and it can be a path on which to travel. It's since become a bit of a theme for my journey letting go, following the path wherever it may lead, um, and staying positive, as Michelle has so beautifully said this morning. I now teach this song to, uh, to choirs and tell my story whenever I can. Now a second key moment, and I'm sure many can relate to this, occurred in my GP's office. We had worked after the first surgery, we worked ourselves into a frenzy, probably fueled by dextromethasone, about whether we should be getting a second surgery, as my surgeon had recommended. We'd been doing our own research, we'd had a second opinion, and that's something I'd highly recommend doing. Our surgeon actually encouraged us to do that. Um, but we were really trying to feel in control. Sitting in the GP's clinic, she stopped us and she said firmly that we're not neurosurgeons, that she trusts the neurologist that she'd referred us to, and he trusts the surgeon. So we need to trust that kind of chain of command and that they're working in their best interests for us. And that was that. A third moment, two years later, in 2014, occurred at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Centre. Somewhat ironically, I was leading an, an open rehearsal of the choir um, in the foyer of the centre, and patients were coming down off the wards to listen in. Now, I'd found out the day before that my cancer had likely recurred, 
and that morning I'd had another MRI just to make sure and I was to find out the next day that, it, that I'd need another surgery. So it was a really turbulent time. Uh, last year, 2015, I, um, I gradually took another step forward after hiding my story really for a few years. I published my story on the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation's website and I ended up telling it too to the uh, annual fundraising dinner in Melbourne. It was such an empowering experience. It was really difficult, but it was worth it. And finally, I remember watching a documentary about the life of Larry Kramer just this year on a plane. Larry Kramer was a, a well-known AIDS activist in New York City. And I remember feeling so angry about brain cancer and its poor survival rates and the lack of change in these rates over so many years. And it's really galvanised a sense in me of wanting to stand up to tell my story, as I am today, to as many people as I can, and to really agitate to improve our survival rates. Where I'd once hoped things would return to the way they were, as years have gone on, I realise that it's uh, no longer business as usual. So it's four years for me after diagnosis. So I'd like to now spend a bit of time talking about the shit stuff. Um, and the first is really around physical and psychological changes. There have been issues with my left hand that I still experience um, in terms of placement of items around the house. Can, can remember, can see seeing kitchen utensils in, in you know, strange places where they shouldn't be, those types of things. Um, and particularly when I get tired, it gets, uh, it gets worse. I've struggled with seizures and they're now under control, but that um, has been an unpredictable part of particularly the last three years. My body image has changed significantly, as you'd all know from dextamethasone. In 2012, uh, the scarring, which I've carefully disguised today with a comb over, um, and three months last year with a shaved head for the radiotherapy. And hair grows back, of course, and I know it's much worse uh, um, for people with chemo as well. But I still feel very vulnerable when thinking about surgeons and doctors having opened up my cranium three times. Uh, it's very sensitive up there now, and I think it gets sensitive each time. My handwriting was never great, and it's not much better now. And unfortunately, my piano playing skills, which are actually really important when you're leading community choirs, have suffered quite a bit. But I work around it. Um, then there are some psychological changes that I think only my partner and I really notice. Things like my patience, um, sequencing and planning. Uh, some of these small tasks, and again, they get worse as you get tired at night. Fatigue, a different level of fatigue and tiredness. Frustration at changed concentration levels and a lack of focus. Um, and that's obviously not good when you're doing a PhD, but it's getting better. One of the other big challenges has been stress on our family relationships. Um, the diagnosis has certainly challenged this aspect of my life, but it's also been a good thing. It's built my family's resilience and coping mechanisms. And they've done an amazing job. Cancer affects everyone around you like ripples of a, from a stone dropped into a pond. Now everyone deals with this stuff differently. For instance, there are questions that we've never asked our surgeon and that we actually had to make that explicit to my family that we hadn't asked that question because they had done all the research. My dad, a year or so after I, I was diagnosed, admitted that he sometimes watched craniotomies on YouTube. <laughs> now that's not, I'm not gonna be doing that, but it's um, <laughs> just the way his scientific mind works. So everyone reacts differently and that's important to remember. My health and diet has been an important aspect here. <laughs> Anyone knows that uh, TV show. That sense of not knowing and judging and needing to judge all the time the potential harms of food and drinks and other activities in our society um, and to be really vigilant about that. But it's certainly been a positive um, thing looking back with some lapses every now and again and that's fine. And a whole lot of other practical stuff around loss of um, income and job security. Um, the self-confidence, I think, that comes with a stable job and a career. Uh, concerns about financial security and that type of thing. We've also had to think about practical issues like life insurance, wills and powers of attorney. And obviously travel insurance. Um, we love to travel. It's also been quite a big emotional journey. Um, this sense of insecurity, of finding purpose in life and balancing those short-term things like holidays and experiences overseas with long-term plans when the horizon is closer than I once thought it would be. And I can imagine how much more difficult this must be for parents with young kids in the room today who are facing cancer. 
Uh, life experience, I feel like I've aged. Um, I'm 35, but uh, you know, I feel like I'm much older uh, compared to those around me sometimes. And I have a strange sense, um, looking back over these surgeries, that things go quickly back to normal. And yet they're never normal, and they're not really ever going to be normal again. Uh, my partner and I regularly seek counselling and support, and these sessions are so important. We do that separately, because there are things I can, that there are, I, I feel like I can't talk to anyone else about, and I'm sure he's the same. Um, I have moments where I feel overlooked by those people living around me. And I dislike going back to some of my old environments, particularly CBD, because it, sometimes it just heightens how much I feel like I've lost in my, from my diagnosis and because of my diagnosis. I've also had um, those cancer conversations. I'm sure people in the room have had many. I remember one uh, at a film festival in February where two acquaintances walked past. We were all in a rush. Um, but I could just tell in their eyes that the only thing they really were worried about was my brain. I think they were looking up, up toward my head. Eye contact and then up. Um, and they just needed reassurance that it was okay. And I've learned to talk my way through other people's tears as I talk about my own journey. Um, rather than comforting them, I continue and they catch up. And I've learned that sometimes it's actually just easier to reassure people who are looking for an it'll be okay. I preserve the gift of my honesty for those who can embrace my cancer diagnosis and have the maturity to handle it. And sometimes I also just blurt it out straight after I meet someone. <laughs> um, it is, after all, a big part of me and my life now. So now I'd like to think about the opportunities of cancer, and I love Albert Einstein's quote here, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. I recently watched a documentary about Joseph Campbell's notion of the hero's journey. And I suspect my connection to this idea is not uncommon for people who've experienced a cancer diagnosis. It makes a sprained ankle or a wisdom tooth removal feel like a walk in the park. Um, it's helped me to foster meaningful connections, to nurture them, particularly with family and close friends. It strengthened my relationship with Kung. It's definitely brought my family closer together too. I actually feel like the carer's journey is harder um, than as a patient and I admire the carers in the room because they really live it too. Um, as I've shared my story publicly more and more after a few years of hiding it away, it's been amazing to me just how many people have been touched by cancer in some way. We're absolutely not alone. I've, learned to dealt, I've dealt with my mortality and that brings up great opportunities to share my story publicly with other people. I've learned to truly appreciate health and, but also to notice sickness around me in a way that I never did before. I've learnt gratefulness, compassion, and I've experienced greater and more vibrant moments of life and living uh, shared with those that I love. My spirituality has also deepened, and I feel more connected than ever to the divine power around us, whatever you may call it. I've learnt to take risks, and if I have to choose between living today or waiting, I live for today. I seize the day, as Robin Williams would have said. Um, it's meant saying goodbye to some things and thanking them, but letting them go. Uh, there will always be regrets, and I accept that, but for my partner and me, it's helped us to focus on now, not tomorrow, and only occasionally on yesterday. I've learned to accept help with, from others with gratitude rather than embarrassment. I attended a cancer retreat recently where they talked about a bus, and I have a big support bus. I've got a wonderful team of people supporting me. Paul, my surgeon, Chris, my neurologist, Jane Staker, who's indispensable as a neuro-oncology nurse coordinator at St Vincent's Hospital, my GP, Pauline, my psychologist, my auntie, who's a nutritionist, friends and mentors who challenge and inspire my spiritual development, and a host of others that I, I know I can call on as I need. I encourage others to seek out support, to see counsellors and therapists regularly, to share the journey that you're on with your carers, but also ensure that they're cared for too. They get help from people who aren't directly involved in your diagnosis. This has been indispensable in our journey, and it's deepened many friendships, professional friendships and personal ones. Most of all, live for today and not for tomorrow. I've been able to reimagine myself as a musician and a choral conductor, and it's really my dream vocation. And it does help also that singing and pursuits where you're fully involved, that idea of being in a flow state, um, are all good for your health and well-being too. And I think everyone has something like this, something that fuels them underneath, whether it's sports, reading, cooking, 
travels, gaming, music, whatever really. This is an opportunity to become your more authentic self, to do what you love doing most, or to continue to do so with awareness and being truly present every moment, if you already are. Thanks.